Uh, hi, so my name is David Holes. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Leap Motion. Uh, we make uh, really cool cutting edge hand tracking devices and I'll try to show you guys a quick demo of that in a few minutes. Uh, my talk is more, a little more general than that though. Uh, it's about just the general future of wearable displays and inputs. Uh, I'm in a kind of unique position where right now most people in this space try to talk to each other as little as possible. Not, not you guys, of course, but you know, the guys who are trying to you know, build these displays, build these input devices, everyone's pretty closed. But everyone talks to us. Because uh, right now everybody, th there's this thing right now everyone's starting to realize that you know, uh, if virtual reality is gonna be like actual reality, we're gonna end up using our hands. <laughs> and uh, we thought that was obvious at the onset, but it's, it's kind of dawning on everyone now. So uh, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And, uh, but what we find is when people come to us, they tend to, they tend to, come, with, with, they tend to come to us with like very different visions of what's gonna happen over the next few years. And uh, of course, cause we're like a real company trying to like make a business in the midst of this. We're trying to figure out, okay, like what is actually gonna happen? And uh, so this is sort of pieced together a little bit. And I, I won't be able to name any names or say anything really like that I shouldn't say, but I can say some things that should be pretty interesting and hopefully stuff that people haven't heard before. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of talk about like the next five years worth with a quick disclaimer saying that if I was gonna tell you exactly what was gonna happen, it would probably sound pretty crazy. So if I don't sound a little bit crazy, there's no chance I'm gonna be right about anything. Uh, it's Arthur C. Clarke. Cool, so I basically, what I do is I kind of break up uh, I'm gonna break up sort of all of these head-mounted displays into sort of three generations, which is something that people don't usually do, and you can quote me, but uh, most people don't, uh, <laughs> don't uh, you know, do this, because uh, no one really knows enough to do it. Uh, so these kind of have these generation one head-mount displays, which, what we, which we kind of call what everybody is using right now, and they're tethered, they're large, they're multi-device products, which means you need, like a, you need like a webcam, you need like a PC, you need like a head-mounted display. It's not just one thing you can hold in your hand and say this is a, head, this is a, this is a product, like this is a singular product. Uh, there's a lot of advantage to this. You know, any computing device can be plugged into these things. Uh, so any computing device can be one of these types of you know, head-mounted displays. But it's very much limited right now by basically 2010s era smartphone technology, device IO, and like 80s era optics. Uh, there's, there's a really interesting price wildcard we're seeing, which is that like people could build these things and sell them for like $99, like just almost nothing, like because, you know, uh, and that's the sort of stuff that people do all the time in the tablet market. So there's definitely something that is interesting about these, uh, but you know, they're gonna come pretty soon and they're pretty much gonna be the least that we can ever expect. Uh, and that's this year, next year, is sort of the year of Gen 1. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Gen 1 sensors. So right now, as you guys know, legacy air devices still exist. We got wheels, joystick, keyboards, mice, you know, et cetera. We're starting to get these handheld controllers like the Razer guys and the PlayStation Move and those stuff is, are getting increasingly refined and there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, and then right now, the sort of touchless motion trackers are undergoing rapid evolution. And now, I'll, 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 by touchless motion trackers, I'll call that, you know, connects us, the PlayStation Eye, the Oculus Head Tracker. Those are all sort of touchless things that track stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, all this stuff is pretty much made with off-the-shelf off, off parts, uh, but we're pretty much limited in every respect, bandwidth, cost, power, size, everything. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to take a quick second, in case somebody has no idea wh what we do at, at Leap. Uh, we make this thing, and it's a Leap motion controller. We recently came out with a mount, and you can put that in, slide it on an Oculus, and uh, basically we uh, have this field of view. It's uh, basically a camera. And uh, everything inside that 135 degree cone is tracked, and everything within that 100 degree cone is like what you see. So anything that you can see, you can then track. And we focus on hands right now. Uh, I'm gonna do a really, I usually spend a long time doing demos, but today we're not gonna have as much time. But basically, you've got a camera. Oh, actually you guys can't see, hold on. All right, yeah, you've got a camera. It's infrared, it's kind of high angle, looks a little weird. Uh, but uh, basically, and there's two, so there's one over here and one over here, and that's all behind the glass, uh, plastic. Uh, and uh, basically, when I put a hand in here, uh, we start tracking it. So what you can see here is uh, basically a skeleton overlaid on top of my hands, and uh, our, this is a V2 tracking, so we used to have a V1 tracking where sort of what you see is what you get. So if you see a finger, we track it. But we found people do lots of things with their hands like this, where basically it's completely sort of unreasonable, unreasonable in quotes, or like this, and they still want to be like, where are the fingers? And we have to tell them, because that's how it is, you know? 
Uh, and it's really important because uh, you know when you're a programmer, you don't want to have to you don't want to have to be like constantly thinking about like can I see it? Can I not see it? I want to just be like take that pointer finger and I don't know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so you can do really visceral physical interactions with this stuff. Uh, here, I'm gonna try to throw one more oh, one more thing over here. Uh, we have a lot of cool demos, I think, out there in front of the tables. Uh, but uh, I'm, so I'm not gonna get to show you anything too crazy here. Uh, but basically, everything's in full 3D, and we're tracking the arms and hands and fingers uh, very finely. And uh, here we still have this sort of very, very, so I can kind of go like, right, you know, here's this part of my finger, or this part of my finger, or this part of my finger, or I can do that, and that, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so that's really, really quick. I'm sorry, I love to show more demos, but I'm gonna keep talking about the future for a second. Uh, uh, from the current slide. Here we go. Cool. So we make motion sensors. That's a motion sensor. What does a motion sensor have to be for VR? Uh, well, it's got to have a big field of view. You should, you know, if you can see it in your field of view of the, of the head mount display, you hopefully can. Like, if you put your hand where you can see it, hopefully you can use it. Uh, and it's got to have a really high frame rate, ideally higher than the head mount display. It's got to be an integer multiple, which is interesting, but I can't really talk about that. Uh, and uh, you need scalable trackings so that you can always know where things are, even if you don't see them and you need to have the lowest latency possible. And right now, you can get 120 frames a second, eight millisecond video latency with a four millisecond latency for the hands with like a roughly 140 by 120 degree field of view. And that's like $79, you can get it at like every Best Buy or something. So you guys can get that right now, it's cool. Lots of people are messing around with it. That's what we do. Uh, so, <clears throat> but of course, this, is a, this was not actually meant for VR. This is just a cool 3D hand sensor for computing in general. Uh, but we're starting to make new ones now that are made for VR, and what might those look like? Uh, so, uh, one of these prototypes we call Dragonfly. Uh, so it's kind of like Oculus has the Crystal Cove. So we're gonna, you know, we kind of have our prototypes. And uh, uh, basically, each sensor is a uh, 3K resolution. So here's like the image of the thing you just saw, and then here's like an image of one of these things. So it's color, it's high resolution, and we've got uh, infrared as well as color. So this is kind of weird, most people aren't familiar with this, but you know, your sensors usually are red, green, blue, red, green, blue, but it's red, green, blue, infrared, red, green, blue, infrared. So we have infrared pixels as well as color pixels. So basically with the infrared pixels, we get an image like this. With the color pixels, we get an image like this. And we track the hands in infrared, and we, let, we pass the video through so it feels like you're looking through a piece of glass instead of uh, uh, ski goggles. Uh, and uh, so that's really cool, and then you start to kind of people when you would give people that they start to fade back and forth. So like maybe all your games you want to play at 20 percent, you know, uh, transparency, so you can still see your environment, or maybe you start to mix sort of augmented reality with actual reality type stuff. And there's a lot of really cool stuff there, and some people are really obsessed with it in the market uh, on the back end, but some people are just totally terrified of it, probably for good reason. It's a big can of worms. When you start putting objects in these sorts of environments that are virtual, you start to be like man, it looks weird, and you realize it's not lit right, and then you have to shoot, I have to compute the lighting in the real environment, and it's, it's a lot of stuff, but it's really cool. And uh, so, yeah, it's basically much higher resolution, much higher speed, bigger field of view, more colors. That's the sort of sense of what you might see immediately after one of these types of devices that you could get at Best Buy right now. Uh, so now we're talking about sort of generation two head-mounted displays. So they're untethered, they're, they're still large form factors, but they're single devices. So like the Samsung Gear, you can actually hold something in your hands now and say this is a VR device, and that's new and kind of crazy. Uh, and uh, we're still 2010s era smartphones. We're slightly newer optics, but still kind of not great optics. Uh, but uh, it's portable, and all cell phones can become them. Uh, and probably the biggest problem is still battery life, as you guys probably know. Uh, and uh, I think what we'll see uh, I'm gonna say I think for everything. I think what we'll see is uh, some, some of something like this, which is sort of like a cell phone with like an iPod headphone jack, and you could plug this in to whatever you're wearing, and it gives you like eight hours of battery life instead of one. And you know you don't have to use it, but stuff like that makes sense, and we're probably gonna start seeing those things more and more. Uh, and uh, the coolest thing about these is that I/O limitations start to disappear. So that means like right now I got to use USB 2.0. And that's really hard. Like that means I can do my, the, the the best by Leap Motion is 40 megabytes a second, and we're pushing that all the time. The Dragonfly you just uh, I was just talking about is 400 megabytes a second, and it, and of course, what if you want to do more than that? Well, you're out of luck. USB 3, that's it. And uh, and so, but you know, phones have this thing called MIPI because phones do video all the time. Like you know, your smartphone has a really good camera, and they can't use USB either. So there is we've kind of solved this problem already in phones. Uh, we just don't have a plug for it on the outside. And I think that'll change at some point soon, because it's just a plug. 
And then at that point, you can kind of put any kind of cameras you want on these, and that's going to be really cool. And uh, 2015, 2017, that's kind of the time frame that we're starting to see them already. Uh, so that sensors, when these things actually become mobile, like you realize, well, I probably don't want to carry a wheel around with me. Uh, and you know, my joystick mice, keyboards, not mobile enough when you're walking around. Uh, holdable controllers are still cool, uh, but they need to become wireless and potentially wearable. Because if I'm carrying this thing around with me all the time, I don't want like Wiimote holsters, you know, where I'm like I can I get my Wiimotes out if I need to use VR all of a sudden. So there's a problem there, and actually someone's got to solve that. Um, but you know, the touchless sensors will continue to expand in breadth and scope. And uh, I don't want to just say hand tracking. Uh, hand tracking is awesome, but like you got to think a little bit wider than that if you want to kind of imagine what this is going to be. Like, not just hand tracking, eye tracking, body tracking, head tracking, object tracking, mouth tracking, environment tracking, and like voice recognition all together. And basically what that is, you get a fusion of all these, of all these input modalities that will like, basically allow for a totally new type of computing. And it's kind of a big deal. No one's really thinking about it yet. But it's, gonna, it's sort of just natural. Like That's just what's going to happen. Uh, software is going to be playing catch up because of that. I think that'll actually be the biggest limit in this generation, more people's thinking more than the hardware or the, or, 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 or the software on the back end. But uh, that'll happen too. Uh, so, you know, you've kind of seen these. This is starting to look, you know, older now, but, you know, phone, magnifying glasses, some kind of camera thing, battery pack, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I'll show you Generation 3 one soon, so it'll be less boring. Sorry. This is, I was showing this a month ago. Uh, so. Why can't we use the uh, phone cameras? Uh, is my, might be one, I'm wondering. Well, it's because the phone camera is really, really tiny. Like that's it's 60 degrees, and you've got like 100 degrees. So you're looking unless you want to look through a toilet paper roll, you kind of need a, a wide field of view. And if you only have one camera, it's really bad. Like I can't express how bad it is. Basically, imagine you have hand tracking, so you're interacting in 3D, and then you want to see through the headset, and everything you're seeing through the headset is 2D. So it feels like you're watching a move. It feels like you're watching an IMAX of your hands, but. You're trying, like you're trying to interact with the world through an IMAX screen. It's very weird uh, and not real. Uh, so these headsets need VR-specific cameras. Uh, and that's what the Dragonfly was. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's talk about Generation 3. Uh, so now you know, we're, we're untethered, and we're getting to small form factors. We're still single devices, but the small form factors come from basically a confluence of, or a fusion of uh, custom displays, custom optics, custom sensors. Because uh, at this point, people are saying, I don't want to just use my phone. I, I don't want I, I you know, I don't, I don't to use my phone for everything. I want like a real device that's made for this. Uh, and uh, when you do that, you start getting lots of things that you didn't get before, like transparency. Uh, there's no reason why screens have to be opaque. And, uh, and so the second you start making screens for this type of thing, you get that. Uh, and uh, they'll be portable. They'll, in some sense, be fashionable, but it will vary. Uh, it will get better. Uh, and. Uh, the wild card is who is going to reinvent themselves to drive these spaces. There's lots of startups doing it right now. There's some big companies starting to do it. Uh, but you know, in the, a lot of companies had a really hard time going from PC to mobile. And going from mobile to this will be, I think, significantly more traumatic. Uh, and uh, so that'll be interesting. And now let me show you what a few of these look like. Uh, I'm, not breaking any NDAs, NDA, I'm not breaking any NDAs here. So you can probably find most of these on the internet if you really look hard. But I can't show you any of my favorites. So this is cool. Uh, this is called a, uh, this is a generation three, this is an example of a generation three Hamas blade. It uses something called a fiber optic collimator. And so what these are, these are little bundles of fiber optics. Basically imagine like a fiber optic tube, and then you carve it out, and this basically makes a flat screen into a sort of virtual curved screen, which removes a lot of the optical difficulties in making something thin. And then you just put a normal lens on here, and then you put in the whole thing, and you get something that's kind of interesting looking that by comparison is much smaller than what we're used to seeing today. Uh, that one's opaque. Looks OK. Uh, and uh, here's another one. This is a, a holographic OLED display. So what you see here is uh, basically you have little OLEDs that are embedded in a piece of plastic substrate. And they shoot out. And then they, they reflect off uh, holographic coating that then bounces it back and focuses it into your eye. Uh, and it's transparent. And they look like this. They're pretty, uh, yeah, they're in a prototype stage. Uh, so that looks. Better. It's interesting. A uh, little bit, you know, colorful, but uh, we're getting, we're on our way to cool. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, now you're wondering, like, you know, the leap. You know, everyone usually says that the leap motion is super small, but look at this thing. Where am I going to put a camera? Like, you have, you know, the sensors have to evolve too. And so they're going to get really small. 
here's a picture of one. Uh, you might, guys might not have seen these before. These are called wafer level cameras. So this is a pencil tip and this is an actual camera. And what it works is you basically have a, you have a chip and then you have little spacers and lenses and they stack them all on top of each other and it's like a three millimeters thick. That might seem a little big for some of them, but then check out this one. So that's another, these are all like stuff that you can get right now. This is not stuff that like people haven't made yet. Uh, so these get small and those have to track hands and environments and cats or whatever you want to interact with. Uh, so you're starting to realize when you get the generation three sensors, they're getting tiny. And when you get tiny, they're, they're going to get ubiquitous. The smaller the head-on display, the smaller the sensors need to be. The average size, I think, will be like three by three by three millimeter for something that needs to track a hand. Uh, you'll probably be able to get up to a 10 by 10 by five, but that's really, you need like uh, Ray-Bans. Like you can't have like sunglasses if you're going to go that size. Uh, you're, these things, we're going to start getting uh, sort of ASICs at this point, which are like specialized chips that make the motion uh, sensing sort of all happen on a tiny circuit. And basically, so you don't, you don't need to use like a big CPU. And so once you have those, you realize, well, you know, uh, I could just take a sensor and I could take one of these ASICs and I could just have a standalone motion sensing device, like without a head mounted display. So basically, and I can start peppering these everywhere and people will. Uh, and it, any, basically any situation where it makes sense. So, so you know, imagine a three by three by three millimeter thing with a little chip, probably gonna cost a couple dollars. It's like almost cheaper than a light switch, but it can track a hand with like full skeletal precision. So we're looking at some weird stuff pretty soon. Uh, and uh, you can imagine things like light bulbs becoming significantly more sophisticated than like a Kinect 2, because there's no reason why they can't. Uh, it, all the sensors are getting there very quickly. And uh, with the processing on board, you can have fully contextualized skeletal tracking with gestures and everything wirelessly transmitted anything nearby that wants to or has permission to have it. Uh, and uh, I guess one last crazy one. To get a sense of what this might look like, I'm gonna, I have a kind of a little ghetto uh, picture. So here's a 10 piece sensor array. And so you've got some sensors looking down, some sensors looking up, sensors looking sideways, some looking forward, and there's actually some looking at your eyes too. And so you have, imagine something like a 260 by 220 degree field of view where basically everything that's around you, you can immediately track both your environment and your, even your mouth and feet because you got some stuff looking down. And that, you know, mouth tracking sounds stupid, but uh, it's cool for two reasons. One is like better voice recognition, and the other one is like you want avatars, right? And so if you want, you know, if you had actual mouth tracking, like your avatar would probably have, you could like smile and stuff, which, you know, I don't know, maybe that's a thing. Uh, uh, so yeah, and, uh, and a lot of things, other things like people want like, you know, you'll be able to track everything from like maybe 10 centimeters away to like five meters away simultaneously. So it's kind of like high dynamic range finding, which is cool, I just made that up as a term. Uh, but it will happen and it, you know, this is the sort of stuff that we talk to people about all the time. Uh, yeah, so sort of in summary, the, the, the potential for change is profound and surreal. You, may not have, you might have missed it, I kind of breezed over a little bit here, but like I said that these Gen 3 things, 2016 to 2019, so you start to realize like every one of these generations I just sort of breezed through have the ability to appear within one year of the other. And that's, you could almost freak out about that, but it's, uh, it's gonna happen. And uh, you know, what we basically have is we have the sort of ubiquity of, and portability of the mobile era meeting the most deeply immersive technologies we can muster as a species. Kind of scary. Uh, and uh, I used to say the dangers of that can only be eclipsed by like the raw potential for evolution and expansion in the same way. Uh, so I usually end this with just saying, won't that be fun? <laughs> and uh, that's my talk. <laughs>